So what would you do with $22? Well, the obvious answer is buy 22 99 cent burritos. But what if you already had lunch? Then you might want this. It's a Yahoo soldering station that I bought on eBay for $22 shipped. If you search online, you'll see a lot of info about the regular 936, which is a knockoff of a Hakko soldering station. This 936B has a couple differences, and today we're going to tear it apart and see how it looks inside. Let's take a look at what you actually get in the box here. An instruction manual, the soldering station here, the iron. Right now it has a chisel tip in it. This is not the tip it came with. I bought a uh, little set of tips. This uses Hakko tips. It comes with a single relatively useless conical tip. I say useless because it's gonna be pretty useless for what I have planned, but maybe it would be useful for you. A little warranty card here, although good luck trying to ever get warranty service on this is my suspicion. And a little iron stand here. This is metal, comes with the sponge. You can see that fits in there like that. There are a couple reasons I went with this one over the regular 936. The 936B has a little more power. Uh, it also has a couple differences that are nice. The power switch is here on the front. On the regular 936, it's over on the side. And this has two LEDs. One is a power LED to tell you the unit is on. The other one is an LED that lights up here when it's actually heating the tip. You can see there's a little calibration pot down in there and of course a dial for setting your desired temperature. Let's start with the tail end of this thing, the power cord. It has some markings on it here, including the brand name Sinofar, Sinofair, not one I am familiar with. It's 105 rated, 18 gauge, and we can tell that it has a thermoplastic jacket probably something like PVC. That's typical in a lot of power tools we've seen. It's not the best jacket material. Uh, thermoset rubber or something like that would be better, but this is normal to see on a tool. There's not you know, much negative to using it in this situation because you won't be moving the station around very much. However, when we go to the front here, we see a similar material, and in this situation, it is kind of a negative. There are not any markings here I can see on the cord to the actual iron. However, we can tell just by feeling it that it again has a thermoplastic jacket. But here, this is kind of a negative because with thermoplastic, it uh, will get stiff in cooler temperatures. You can see it has kind of some kinks in it because if you have it wound up, it'll take a set. It's just not as flexible as some other materials like thermoset rubber or silicone. So thermoset rubber or especially silicone would be a much better material to use in this application. And they probably did not use it because it would be more expensive. Like I said before, this uses Hakko tips. I swapped in this chisel tip. Here's the element itself. Uh, it's a ceramic element and we can see it has kind of a, a, a metal case around it right down here on the bottom. Let's see if I can get the rest of this thing open. Not a surprise in a cheap product like this, but plastic threads on all these materials after a lot of heat cycles, they might wear out because I suspect this is not the greatest type of plastic. Uh, I don't have my multimeter with me, but I did check this earlier, check for continuity between the tip and the ground plug, and there is continuity there, so that is properly grounded. That's good to see. These claim to be ESD safe. I think that's probably a little bit of an exaggeration. I, I doubt they have the uh, same uh, static discharge materials used that they use in a real Hakko. So overall, looking at the handpiece here, obviously not high dollar construction, but about what I would expect at this price point. This is one area where I think stepping up to a genuine Hakko tip might fix this. These knockoff Hakko tips are a little bit loose on here. A tighter fit will more uh, effectively transmit the heat from the heating element to the tip.
I was interested in tearing this thing apart because if you search online for these Yahua soldering stations, I don't know how it's pronounced, so I'm just gonna say Yahua, you'll find a lot more information about the regular 936 than this 936B model. And the reviews of the regular 936 are actually pretty decent. Another reason I wanted to take this apart is because a much bigger channel than mine that a lot of you have probably heard of, EEV Blog, tore apart one of the regular 936 models, and while it was functional, it was really, really ugly inside. The build quality was not that great. So I wanted to see if this 936B would be any different. Looks like I got all the screws out there. So let's open this thing up. Once you get into these things, you see that there's not really that much to them. Mainly on this part, you're going to have the transformer doing most of the work in this thing. We actually have a build date here. It was built about eight months ago. Uh, obviously, this is a transformer made for the US market, so it's 110 volt rated. There are a few details in here I see uh, that they could have skipped if they wanted to really pinch pennies. We have a inline fuse here, that's good to see. A, a strain reliever here, here on the cord, obviously they would need to have that, but this is a decent one. And on the connections here, uh, they did use heat shrink tubing over the connections for a little bit of reinforcement and protection from the elements. That's nice to see. One thing that's not so great to see here is the ground lug. It's partially crimped, that's good, uh, but this part here is just kind of tacked on with solder. I've seen some arguments about this online saying it should be crimped because if it's just a soldered connection, uh, if something starts going awry, you don't want current uh, to be able to produce enough heat to melt the connection and you lose your ground. So it's good that they have uh, uh, at least partially a crimped connector on here. I think it would probably be better to have this crimped on there as well. So at least in this part of the thing, overall, it does not look too bad. I'm going to try to get this thing apart so we can look at the circuit board. On the EEV blog video, this is where the build quality got really ugly, was on the circuit board itself. So here I will pull off the knob. We see we have a calibration pot here and it's, it's properly aligned on that EEV blog video. It was not properly aligned, so it wouldn't be very easy to adjust the calibration pot. Not the easiest access here to the screws holding in the control board. Electronics are not really my favorite thing to take apart. You know, I know a good bit about them, but I'm not an expert and I'm just more interested in mechanical bits but I wanted to open this thing up to make sure that it had the basic safety requirements in place. We did see a proper ground on there and an inline fuse, so I'm glad to see those. All the screws are out, so remove this little nut on the outside of the potentiometer here on the front, and it should come apart. Let's start on the back side here. Uh, not terrible, but not great either. Check out this big stain here. There clearly was not a lot of cleanliness in the production of this thing. It looks to me like uh, this is being used as an adhesive to hold this connection together to lock it in. Yep, I think that's right because we see more over here to lock these connections together so vibration doesn't uh, shake them loose. That is actually nice to see. The actual solder joints themselves don't look too bad. Again, this is a place where on the EEV blog one, they, well, some of them looked pretty ugly. I saw a couple here, uh, that don't have solder on them, but then of course you see there are no traces going to them, so they must not be used in this application, for example, on the back side of this chip here. So we flip it over to this side and we see again, lots of staining from the production. It is nice to see uh, this hot glue here uh, serving to hold these LEDs in place. Everything else looks laid out decently well. Again, kind of crusty and dirty looking. 
Here is something that's pretty weird. We have this triac here, which is serving as a switch. And typically on these, there is a heat sink back here. And this hole is for a screw to go through there and hold it all together. You can see that there is no heat sink and there's nothing holding it in place other than these three soldered joints. So it's basically just flapping in the breeze here. So uh, yeah, this is not great. So I gotta say, overall, this thing looks functional, uh, but it's not going to win any beauty contests, that's for sure. Just the uh, production details, the cleanliness, obviously, little steps that they skipped. Uh, there are definitely ways this could be improved. But then you gotta get back to the price point of this thing. I mean, it was only 22 bucks. So overall, I would say it could be worse, but yeah, it's far from the best quality. One thing that I am actually kind of impressed with is this stand. It's all metal, so you're not going to be melting it if you accidentally poke it with the iron when you're using it. So how does this compare to the one uh, we saw over on EEV blog? Well, I would say maybe a little bit better quality on this one, but overall some of the same ugliness, some of the same shoddy details that we saw on his regular 936. I've been using this thing a little bit and my initial impressions are good. This thing has been working well. It would be nice to have a better cable for the actual iron, that's clear. But it's also clear that I need a lot more practice and my soldering technique needs a bunch of improvement. But this thing so far is a good fit for what I'll be doing, which is just little hobby jobs and electrical repairs. So I might have more videos on how this performs in the future if I learn anything surprising. But for now, I gotta say, the build quality on this is not great. But when you consider it's 22 bucks, I don't think it's terrible. There are some things they could have skipped to cut costs even more. So yeah, for $22, I say give it a shot. But if you want something good quality, you might be better served trying to find a used Hako or Weller or some kind of name brand station. So what do you guys think? Is this thing worth 22 bucks? Let me know in the comments down below. And while you're down there, hit that subscribe button and that like button. Thanks for watching.